Division of Graduate Education here at UCLA. And before we get started with the evening's festivities, I want to note that as a land-grant institution, UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielini Gar, which is the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. We are so excited to have you all here with us for the final round of UCLA's 2023 Grad Slam competition this evening. <laughs> Tonight, gentlefolk, we will select UCLA's winner who will go on to compete for the title of UC Grad Slam champion at a University of California-wide competition on May 5th in San Francisco, California. Grad Slam allows our extraordinary, our truly extraordinary graduate students to showcase their innovative research and give the rest of us a chance to learn about it. We appreciate all of you being here to support these inspiring and brilliant scholars. As mentioned, Grad Slam challenges emerging scholars to open their research to the public through the workshops and coaching sessions that are part of Grad Slam participation, uh, and uh, sorry, Grad Slam preparation and participation, uh, and hosted by the Division of Graduate Education in partnership with colleagues across campus and the community, graduate students develop skills that will help them communicate their work to diverse audiences. From explaining it to friends and family, and I'm sure your friends and family appreciate the training you're receiving here, uh, friends and family, to sharing it at conferences and developing a pitch for private grantors, employers, and the media. Taking part in Grad Slam allows students to expand their skill set and advance the vital research they do here at UCLA. This year, 89 graduate students from disciplines across campus entered the competition. 58 submitted preliminary videos, and 20 moved on to in-person semifinal rounds, which took place two weeks ago. Today, you will hear from the 10 finalists and select the first, second, third, and audience choice winners. May I ask this year's finalists uh, and any students who participated in the semifinal and preliminary rounds to please stand as we applaud your efforts. <laughs> Thank you. We are here to commend and celebrate you tonight. Thank you for all the work you do every day and the time you put into this competition uh, to share such invaluable work with the rest of us. This evening, the 10 finalists will compete to articulate their research to us in understandable, compelling, and engaging ways in three minutes or less. We have a distinguished panel of judges who will score each presentation based on the following criteria. Clarity, organization, delivery, appropriateness, intellectual significance, and engagement. The judges will award up to five points for each category for 30 possible points. Thanks to the generous contributions of our supporters, we are able to offer the following fellowships to the top three contestants and the audience choice winner. At third place, the winner will receive a $2,000 fellowship. Our second place winner will receive a $3,000 fellowship. And the first place winner will receive a $5,000 fellowship. Based on your votes, your votes, the Audience Choice Award winner will receive $1,000. Yes. <laughs> Last but not least, our remaining finalists will each receive a $500 fellowship. And that brings us up to a total of $14,000 in cash prizes. And our goal at the Graduate Division, uh, Division of Graduate Education is to expand the Grad Slam competition to reach even more students in future years and provide professional development opportunities for every area on campus. I want to take a moment to thank and recognize the people and the organizations that have made Grad Slam possible. Our Grad Slam sponsors, our gracious host, the California Nanosystems Institute, and the UCLA store. This year's Grad Slam supporters, whose generous contributions to the program allow UCLA graduate students to expand their skills and advance their research, include Meredith and Philip Berkowitz, Dr. Jerome and Randy Greenberg, Jerry Schneider, Charles Steinmetz, and Drs. Joseph and Jennifer Watson. I would also like to thank the core Grad Slam team for their hard work behind the scenes. Here tonight, making this entire event happen are Araceli Barriga, Pete Clues, Ivy Ebwin, Frances Francesca Gaccio, Courtney Guevara, Vanya Shalini, 
and Chris Sosa. Finally. Finally, I want to acknowledge the more than 100 people and departments that helped make the 2023 Grad Slam workshops and coaching sessions possible. Many of you are here tonight, sitting in the audience, and lending your time to make this event happen. Thank you so much for your contributions to this celebration of our graduate students' research. A complete list of acknowledgments is available on the Grad Slam website. I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing my co-host, Noor Nakahi, uh, who will review some details about the competition. Noor is a doctoral student, doctoral candidate, excuse me, congratulations, Noor, a doctoral candidate in computer science and is currently the president of the Graduate Student Association. Thank you, yeah, I just told her I'm a candidate. It took me four years to become a candidate, so I don't wanna miss that. Um, thank you so much, Associate Dean um, Lopez. Good evening, everyone. Um, I remember the first time that I attended Grand Slam, as just a uh, person who comes and watches, uh, was three years ago. Uh, one of my friends, Wadi, he won um, the audience award. Uh, it, was, it was pretty good. And I learned a lot about how, how much amazing research our scholars are doing at different departments at UCLA. Um, so thank you all for participating and uh, just letting us know what kind of amazing work you're doing. Um, we are also delighted that family members and friends who cannot be here tonight um, can view the competition via our um, webcast. Um, audience will be here. Hello. Um, uh, for uh, those of you who are using social media, um, if you want to post on Instagram, take a video, take a picture, um, you can um, uh, mention UCLA at UCLA Grad School um, um, to just share it with us um, and use any of these hashtags, hashtag Grad Slam, hashtag UCLA Grad Slam, hashtag UCLA Grad Slam 23, um, hashtag uh, influencer, I think. Um, as you see here, um, there's a clock, there's a timer clock uh, facing the stage. Uh, there will be a 10 second countdown to cue each speaker to start at the end of um, the 10 seconds. If a speaker goes beyond the three minutes, um, points will be deducted from the final score, beginning with a one point deduction at 3.303 um, and one point being taken off every two seconds. Um, the speaker continues to speak after that. So presenters, if you reach three minutes, you need to stop talking. Um, between each presenter, um, the judges uh, sit in the first row here. Um, Associate Dean uh, will introduce our judging panel shortly. Uh, we'll have about three minutes to complete their scorecards. During the time, I will be talking to each of the presenters so we can get to know each of them better. Um, after the last presenter, we will take a 10 minute break while our uh, tabulations committee totals the scores and determines the winner. During the break, we invite everyone to the, in the audience, um, both in person and online, uh, to vote for your favorite presenter. Um, you can vote online by using your phones. If you have a camera, then you can scan the QR code. Um, instructions for audience voting can be found on our YouTube channel and will also appear on the screen during the break, so don't worry about it now. You'll see the slide on with QR codes. You can just scan it and do it there. Um, during the break, you're also more than welcome to just walk around, uh, refresh yourself if you want to refresh because you couldn't bring water or anything. Um, in this auditorium, you can just drink water um, or take a bio break. Um, we then will return. Uh, we'll announce the winners, take photos, and then enjoy refreshments in the lobby to celebrate our finalists and what they've done so far. Now I will turn back to Associate Dean Lopez, um, who will introduce our panel of judges and start the competition. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noor. Judges, you have a very fun and challenging job this evening, as you will hear fantastic presentations about fascinating research from various fields. And you heard the criteria. It's not about whether students will cure disease or discover the latest archaeological artifact. It's about whether they can engage their audience and communicate their research effectively. Judges, I would like to take a moment to introduce you to our audience. So 
kindly stand, turn, and wave to the audience as I announce your name, o or not, as you wish. Uh, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> but if you do stand, please remain standing until I've read all of your names, and audience, please hold your applause until I've read all the names. Uh, first, we have Robert Buswell and Christina Lee Buswell, Thomas J. Bai, Yolanda Gorman, Jerome Greenberg, Julie Sina, and Michelle Sitio. Thank you, judges. <laughs> we genuinely appreciate your involvement with Grad Slam and the time you are committing to being here with us today to support UCLA's emerging scholars. Are you ready? Yeah? <laughs> All right, then, let's go. Our first presenter will be Jenna, Jenna Wabe from Bioengineering <laughs> discussing. You haven't even heard her title yet and you're cheering. It's going to be a great night discussing redefining the gold standard of degenerative disc treatments. You may be surprised to learn that your neck is composed of seven bones with one squishy disc between each. These discs are about the size of an M&M with the consistency of jello. Now can you imagine an M&M shaped jello holding up your head and supporting every neck motion you have? It's not that much. This is why over 80% of the population suffers with severe neck pain due to degenerated discs and 20% will go on to need surgical removal of these discs. My work will focus on improving these surgical treatments through laboratory testing before clinical use. The current gold standard in the US now is removing the affected disc and fusing the adjacent bones together. This completely eliminates the motion between those bones. But should we consider this the gold standard? I certainly wouldn't. Another option, which does maintain the motion between the bones while also providing relief from painful symptoms is the replacement of the affected disc with an artificial one. These artificial discs have yet to gain widespread adoption in the US despite their relative success worldwide. But I'm here to fix that problem. To increase the performance and promote the use of these devices, we need to be able to test these in a laboratory setting before going into patients and continue to monitor their success throughout their time in use. Testing in the lab typically requires the use of cadavers. Yes, this means bones from real people, but this can be quite costly and testing is hindered by the wide variability of cadaver bones, leading to somewhat unreliable results. So to address this roadblock, I'm using 3D printing techniques to create the first ever reproducible cervical spine model verified and validated for actual biomechanics testing. My 3D printed model mimics the intricate properties of the cervical spine including the vastly different strengths in 11 different anatomical regions. These strengths range from that of conventional Tupperware to pure aluminum. With my detailed model, I can now reliably assess these devices in a laboratory setting. Right now, only about 60% of these devices are lasting more than five years in patients as young as 30 years old. That means at 35, you're having another invasive surgery and losing your motion between those bones. But with more comprehensive testing, using models like mine, we can raise this five-year success rate from 60% to well over 90% by addressing common complications such as movement of the device or undesired bone growth. With my model, I will identify and address the clinical flaws of these artificial discs, redefining the gold standard for patients with degenerative disc disease. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I learned a lot. Um, Thank you, Mel. I actually have my model with oh, me. Oh, okay. Um, you can look at it if you'd like and pass it around. Um, there was, okay. There so was a picture of it. You yeah. can see slightly mm. some of the changes, but okay. it's difficult to see with the naked eye. This is a 3D model that <laughs> Jenna has used. This is pretty cool. Thank you so much. Of course, yeah. Um, if anyone oh. would like to look at it, just let me know after. Yeah. 
Well, Happy when spirits. you're <laughs> taking your break. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so first question, why did you decide to register for Grad Slam? Well, Grad Slam is a great experience to be able to practice public speaking. Um, but the reason that I truly got into it was my boyfriend decided to do it, and okay. I didn't want to feel left out. <laughs> nice. <So. laughs> it's, a good, it's a valid reason. It's a good reason. Um, but I've learned so much by doing it, and it's, it's been so great to make it through the semis and hear all yeah. the talks in there. So I've really enjoyed the process. Yeah, cool. That's great. Thank you. Um, what is a fun fact that you want to share with us about yourself? Um, a fun fact about me mm -hmm. is I spent three years living in Shanghai, China. So that was a really incredible experience for me. Ooh, what, what did you like most about Shanghai? Um, I loved the proximity to other countries. We were able to travel so much and explore so much of Asia that we haven't been able to do since moving back to the States. So it was truly an incredible experience to, to be able to travel so much and meet so many unique people that came from so many different parts of the world. Being living in Asia, I agree. Um, what are your interests outside your research? Um, I really enjoy being outside. I like to run. Um, I did the LA Marathon last year, yeah. but got really injured, so I unfortunately will not be running it this year. Um, but hopefully next year I'll be back out there. And then um, I really enjoy hiking. I'm from the Bay Area Ooh, okay. before coming down to yeah. LA, which has some beautiful hikes. So we really like to get out there hiking and backpacking. Okay. Do you have any favorite trails around LA? LA is a little more tough because the trails are quite far away. So mm, I agree. Um, this weekend we were actually hiking up in Will Rogers yeah. up in Malibu, which is probably the nicest place you can go hiking in LA. Yeah, I agree. You can have a great ocean view. It's not like you have some some shade depending. Well, now this winter it's not cloudy enough. Yes, and this um, weekend was not the best weekend to hike. So. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> yeah, no, I went. Yeah. Thank you so much. Of course, well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Give it up for Jenna. And now, shortly. Well, now, in shortly, <laughs> we will hear from Elaine Jessica Castillo Tamango from Education. And she will be talking about Choose Your Own Adventure, Exploring Factors That Complicate Career Choice. Can you remember the first time someone asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? At the time, did you already think there was a right answer or a wrong one, or even that you get laughed at? Is it possible this affected what you chose to pursue? The aim of my research is to better understand how these perceptions form, particularly for Filipino Americans. I hypothesize that even though today's Filipino Americans were not directly subject to colonization, the remnants of colonialism continue to impact their career choices. Scholars have already connected colonial era initiatives to Filipinos choosing careers for immigration purposes. A Filipina historian once said, that the Philippines spent 300 years in the convent and 50 years in Hollywood. Spain brought Catholicism, and the US brought the American dream, sort of. In 1898, the Philippines was transferred to the US at the end of the Spanish-American War, until Philippine independence <coughs> was recognized on July 4th, 1946. July 4th is not a coincidence, by the way. During those 50-ish years, the Americans built hospitals, nurse training programs, and English-speaking schools. Filipino students were sent to the US to learn American traditions and continue them back in the Philippines. These initiatives, along with selective immigration policies, helped the US to cultivate a pipeline of English-speaking and American-trained individuals to be a labor force for needed industries such as nursing. My research focuses on their descendants, who were born in the United States, and how Filipino Americans are also overrepresented in nursing, even without immigration as a motivation. We know early career aspirations are shaped by what we're exposed to. But consider, what if your parents' generation was specifically allowed into this country because of their career choice? Or what if you knew other immigrants with degrees in fields like philosophy or even medicine who were allowed to immigrate but could not transfer their education to comparable work once in the US? Your decision becomes affected by not just your immediate social context, but potentially the wider conditions forming these early messages around the viability of certain careers. 
the case of Filipino Americans, colonialism has had an impact on Philippine education, economy, and society for several generations. I found that Filipino Americans share a sentiment of wanting to pay back their parents for all the sacrifices they made, and I know many of you can relate. The way to do that is to pursue higher education. But I question whether that can end this cycle of thinking only certain careers are viable options. My research is unique in looking at how colonialism has impacted Filipino Americans' career outcomes, but it may also have implications for how we study and support the descendants of all colonized peoples. My goal is that educators make more options seem possible and that for all of us, as mentors and loved ones, help widen the definition of what it means to be successful. So let me end by asking you all, how do you want the next generation to feel when they are asked? What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, sometimes we don't really think about what has affected us uh, for the choice that we're making, mm -hmm. what we want to do. Um, okay, uh, why did you compete in, like, decide to compete in the Grand Slam? Yeah, I saw the videos they would send each year, and it looked like fun. And um, some of my friends uh, who work at grad division wanted more humanities and social sciences to scientist students to be part of it. So I thought, why not? Yeah, <laughs> not grad division anymore. Education. Oh, sorry. Uh, like no division of it. Yeah, it's I, I constantly try to say DG. It's yeah. <laughs> um, do you have anyone in the audience or watching online? Oh well, I've got my friends from both my master's <laughs> program and some of my former students here today. And I want to say hi to my mom, um, who's watching um, at work, hopefully. My mom's a nurse, and so part of my research is looking at you know, the immigrants and their children, I oh. think. <laughs> OK, I'm sure all of them are so proud of you, Thank you. as we are, as our colleagues. Um, what do you do for fun outside uh, of Oh, work? for fun? Uh, mm. So I, uh, I love my plants. I love my succulents. I've also got a puppy. Oh, who's not a puppy anymore? She's like 11. So oh, okay. <laughs> my 11-year-old puppy. puppy, always um, puppy. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I love, yeah. And, and I love UCLA. I love walking around campus and, and making, you know, seeing all the architecture and things like that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How have you been here at UCLA? Long <laughs> I've been at UCLA okay. for a while. I started here in 2013 uh, and came back after for my PhD program. And so. how has been the experience in general? Yeah, you know, I think um, UCLA, it, it feels like such a big, big school, mm -hmm. but you form these little communities that are really supportive, um, and, and that's like what makes it feel you know, more homey than you'd expect from a big, mm -hmm. big campus. Fun fact, if you didn't know, our campus is the smallest UC campus, yeah. which, <laughs> it, yeah. Um, and if you want to tell us one fun thing about yourself, the one, yeah. Oh, thanks, yeah. Um, in the spirit of Asia, I uh, lived in Japan for a year, and I climbed Mount Fuji during that time. It took eight hours to go up and four hours to go down. It, it took a long time, but <laughs> the, <laughs> the sunrise at the top was so worth it. I don't know if I could do it again, but maybe if I trained a little bit more, I could go back Wait, there. so you went there, so you be at sunrise? You hiked during the night? You hiked during the night, yeah. We started at like 9 p.m. in the evening. Wow. We got up there, and everyone was just yelling out, Ohio goodbye mess at the morning. <laughs> it was so <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Pretty cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give it up for her. Thank you. <laughs> Hiking all night long. I really thought that was going to be like hike and camp and wake up. And then she said that. Next up, we have Judah Van Zant from Astronomy and Astrophysics. <laughs> discussing the distant giant survey uncovering the origins of Earth-like planets. The stars awaken a certain reverence, because though always present, they are inaccessible. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote these words nearly 200 years ago. And while much of his sentiment remains true today, distant stars and the planets they harbor are more accessible now than they have ever been. Just 30 years ago, we had not discovered a single planet beyond our own solar system, known as an exoplanet. Today, we know of more than 5,000. 
and we use these discoveries to study how planets form. I'm currently doing precisely that by searching for systems of exoplanets that resemble our own solar system. My work will uncover the relationships between Earth and its neighboring planets, a major step toward understanding the origins of habitable worlds. For over three years, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope continuously observed more than 150,000 stars, searching for brief dips in the star's brightness caused by a planet passing in front. Data from Kepler taught us that small planets close in to their host star are extremely common. On average, there is one such planet orbiting every sun-like star in the Milky Way galaxy. Another population that has come into focus is the distant giants. These planets are like Jupiter, large, gaseous, and far away from their host star. So close-in small planets are quite common, while distant giants are somewhat rare. Unfortunately, our discoveries of these two planet types come from almost completely separate stellar populations. So we don't understand how they affect each other's formation in the same system. For example, the planets in our own solar system are divided into two distinct subgroups. The presence of the inner rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and the outer giants, Jupiter and Saturn, could be evidence that these two planet types help each other form. But does this pattern exist in other systems? I'm currently leading a survey to answer this question by searching for distant giant planets in systems where an inner small planet is already known to exist. I've discovered 10 new giant planets already. And at the end of my survey, I will calculate the fraction of close-in small planets that are accompanied by a distant giant neighbor. This is an exciting result. With it, I can determine the conditions under which Earth-like planets form, bringing us closer to understanding our own solar system and the potential for life beyond it. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. This is a boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for motivating her. Uh, we really enjoyed your presentation also. Uh, what made you compete in Grassland? Uh, well, originally my advisor actually suggested it to me uh, last year as a great way to kind of uh, get involved with public communication and outreach and also to better understand my own research. And I think that, that absolutely is true. Kind of summarizing your research in only three minutes is a great way to really grasp the most important parts. Uh, and then beyond that, I think I've just really enjoyed kind of developing my passion for sharing what, what I enjoy researching with, with other people. And it's uh, a really amazing experience to see kind of people's faces light up to learn about planets and, um, you know, our understanding of the universe. Yeah, I heard people gasping. Yeah, advisors be, like, mm -hmm. telling you, like, you need to know what you're doing in your, like, fourth or five years. It's pretty common, unfortunately. Um, okay, what do you know what you want to do after graduation? Uh, yeah, so I am just nearing the end of my fourth year, so probably another two years. Uh, but nevertheless, at the time of graduation, I would love to uh, get some kind of opportunity to continue researching and continue sharing that research with others. So if that looks like, looks like getting a you know, research position in a lab or a, a postdoc of some kind, that would be absolutely ideal for me. If you've got a position, hit him up. Uh, <laughs> what is a fun fact about yourself? Ooh, let's see, a fun fact. Well, my original fun fact is actually that my girlfriend is also uh, <laughs> one of the Grad Slam participants. <laughs> Um, and along those same lines, actually, we recently uh, picked up dancing classes. Ooh. Yeah, so we thought it would also be a good way to round out not only the research side of our lives, like we are here, but, you know, the social aspect and learn a fun new skill together. So that's been really fun. Can I ask what kind of dancing? Yeah, it's called West Coast Swing. <laughs> right. So originally I wanted Fancy. to do, like, a ballroom dance, but the instructor <laughs> yeah. was like, you know, you can only really do those in, like, really upscale situations, but if you learn what's called a social dance, Instead, you can take that both to an upscale situation, you know, like a wedding or something, or you could just go out to a party or a club or something, and it's just as applicable there. So that seemed like the best of both. Yeah, pretty cool. And what do you do for fun outside research? Oh, for fun. Well, pretty much all the things Jenna said. I <laughs> 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 uh, no, but I love, uh, I love hiking, dancing, newly. Um, let's see. Uh, 
since starting grad school, I've gotten a lot more involved with some of my uh, fellow grad students in amateur astronomy as opposed to professional astronomy. So that looks like you know, getting a telescope and going out camping, for example, in Joshua Tree or something like that. And you know, the skies in the city of LA are not that great because of the light pollution. Uh, but once you get outside a couple of hours, it's really beautiful. And you can just go out there and you can see planets. You can see the Milky Way. Uh, you can see that comet that you guys have probably heard about. It's kind of uh, just made closest approach with Earth, I think, last month. So yeah, it'll be really fun. OK, thank you so much. Give it up. Thank we'll you. That. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Ella Petter from Computer Science speaking about unlocking the power of big data to improve cancer research. Imagine for a moment you're going on a journey to a new destination. You pack your bags, grab your map, if you're anything like me, you pack a bunch of snacks and head out. But as you're driving, you realize that your map is incomplete. It shows the final destination, but not the twists and turns of the way. Now imagine you're on a journey to beat cancer. The destination is clear, remission and recovery. You also have a general idea about how to get there. But what about the twists and turns? You may think, I will just follow the car ahead of me. But you see, cancer is not one disease. Specific tumor genes drive specific tumor behaviors. Uncovering this link between tumor genetics and tumor behavior is the basis for cancer research and a discovery of targeted drugs. For example, if we know some gene is making the tumor more aggressive, we can develop a targeted drug that blocks this pathway. Cancer research is limited by two aspects. One, data, and two, methods to analyze this data. Traditionally, cancer research relies on patient survival data, and it works quite well. However, by only looking at a limited set of time points, in this case, start and end of patient follow-up, we're missing a lot of information. Now, can you please raise your hand if you ever thought or heard someone say, this can be improved with big data? <laughs> I see many of you have. Well, buzzwords aside, this can be improved with big data. And understanding how is the goal of my PhD project. What I mean when I say big data is just a lot of data, like what we have nowadays in electronic health records. Specifically, we can access information collected over time revealing trends and dynamics that were previously hidden. So we have new data, and now we need new methods. I work with thousands of oncology patients right now. This includes information about the drugs they receive, the progression of their disease, and their response to treatment. I work to develop a method that utilizes this more complex data to better understand how genetics affects the disease. It's like updating our toolkit so we can unlock the power of modern data sets. I was excited to discover my method uncovers novel associations that were undetectable by traditional means. This is promising. It could lead to the discovery of new targeted drugs, drugs and improve patient care. With each discovery, we add more and more details to the map until hopefully one day patients can simply pack their favorite snacks and drive safely to remission. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, we all enjoyed it. Uh, first question, why did you decide to complete in grad science? Well, honestly, I always had like this problem when someone would ask me, what do you do? Especially family. I, I'd be, I do like a terrible job about, I don't know, balancing trying to be specific about what I actually do and then being like so specific that they get lost in my explanation. So I just wanted this opportunity, I think, to understand better what's the big picture. What can I say? So yeah, us computer science students, we do more than installing Windows, <laughs> if you were wondering. I, um, have, I have this niece who, when I would talk about my research, she would be like, 
but what do you do when you wake up? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I still I still don't have an answer for this, but uh, I do my best. Okay. Um, all right. Um, what is a fun fact about you? Um, well, I'm an international student, so I moved to California uh, just when I started the graduate school, and I really enjoy hiking around here and discovering new places in California. Ooh, where are you from? Uh, Israel. Okay. And what is your, when is your, where is your favorite place in California? I think, I haven't been to everything on my to-do list yet, but I think that Joshua Tree is one of my favorites right Ooh, now. Joshua Tree is ahead, apparently. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, and what, uh, what do you do outside research for fun? Uh, I spend time with my family and friends. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. So all the family and friends are here. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much. Thank Give you. For thank you. And now we will hear from Alexander Quacko uh, from Education speaking about reducing bias in standardized tests. As we listen to the Grad Slam talks today, we might think to ourselves, wow, that was a great talk, or they were so well prepared, and we might think we're being objective. In fact, the judges here are asked explicitly to be objective in their grading. Yet social psychology shows that our human judgment is anything but objective. We're all biased much more than we think. It's called implicit bias because we're not even aware of it. It just happens. Implicit bias affects everything from prison sentences to medical diagnoses, to hiring decisions. I work in the field of educational assessment, specifically standardized language tests. These tests are high stakes. They can determine what classes you're allowed to take in high school, and whether or not you're accepted into college or graduate school. Unfortunately, language tests are also affected by implicit bias. Here's how. First, students speak their answers into a microphone. Their speech is recorded, and then the recordings are scored by human raters. Even though the human raters are trained and monitored over time, they're still unwittingly influenced by implicit bias. This means that students who have a particular accent, for instance, may unintentionally be given a lower score than they deserve and potentially barred from higher education. So what can we do about implicit bias in standardized tests? It's not like we can open up our brain and remove the parts we don't like, except in a way we can. Recent advances in the technology behind artificial intelligence, or AI, offer a solution. Researchers have already shown that it's possible to train a machine to identify and remove certain types of bias in text, which is called debiasing. In my research, I'm applying these debiasing techniques for the first time to standardized language tests. To accomplish this, I first trained the machine to score the English Although it's able to score speech as accurately as human raters, it also learns human raters biases. Now that I have an accurate but biased automated scoring system, I'm teaching the machine how to identify biases and how to stop outscoring them. I'll measure how much bias I can reduce, and I'll figure out which debiasing techniques are most effective. My project will help ensure that all students, regardless of gender or ethnic background, are evaluated fairly and it'll contribute to a larger body of research showing how we can use AI to supplement the shortcomings of our human judgment and help us take small but valuable steps towards a more equitable society. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much. Great thank presentation. You. I'm learning a lot today from y'all. <laughs> um, all right, first things first, why did you Decided to um, yeah, why, um, well, I guess I've kind of heard about it. I keep seeing the emails year after year. Um, yeah, that's and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and a few of my friends have participated, and it seems really cool. And um, I feel like uh, it's finally at a stage in my um, graduate school career where I have something to say. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been a really great experience to graduate from people who've known me my whole growth. So yeah. Okay. All right. And what is a fun fact about you? Oh, before I answer, could I say, um, um, and thank you to my partner who's here now and she's listening to me um, countless times through this, so <laughs> <laughs> she's watching. Um, 
so fun fact. Um, so I trained my cat during COVID. Um, we were all stuck um, in lockdown. So I trained my cat to do some tricks because I had a lot of time to do that. And um, so I read this book by uh, that my partner gave me by Peter Popovich, who's this famous cat trainer. And I literally just followed what he said, and my cat like started doing the tricks. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Um, well, sh okay, so they're not the great. So she can do up cats, so I'll do this, and then she'll get on her hind legs. And, do <laughs> um, and then she does uh, gimme fire. And so I do gimme fire. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. All right, and what do you do for fun outside music? Um, for fun, um, I mean, research is fun. But I, uh, <laughs> outside of research, I do, um, I, I mostly play video games. I know all of the contestants are uh, going outside and doing fun <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> What is your favorite game? Um, so I play uh, with like old friends, and so we'll play um, like kind of collaborative games where there's like multiple people. So uh, Deep Rock Galactic and Hoping and Sea Dogs for Mars and Venus. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for Thank sharing. You Thank you. Give it a Next up, we have Siddhartha Srivastava. Uh, from Material Science and Engineering, speaking about cancer diagnosis from saliva using lasers. Imagine you're the Secretary of Health to the US government, and you're extremely worried about the fact that in the past year, over 600,000 people have died of cancer in the US. But now you're presented with this encouraging data from the CDC that if diagnosed in the early stages, the five-year survival rate for most types of cancer is over 90%. But now you get tense again because in the early stages, most cancers don't have any obvious symptoms. And to screen the entire population using existing invasive techniques like biopsies is practically impossible. So you ask yourself, could it be possible to diagnose cancer from saliva just like we've done for COVID. Herein comes my PhD, where I utilize the power of material science and machine learning to tackle this problem. But first we ask, what should we look for in saliva? The answer is exosomes. Exosomes are particles released by all the cells in our body, including disease cells. What's fascinating about exosomes is that they act as a screenshot of the cells that produce them. So an exosome from a cancer cell contains the markers of the disease itself. What's more, exosomes are extremely stable in our blood supply, and some of them do end up in our saliva. Now this sounds perfect, so why haven't we diagnosed cancer from saliva already? That's because exosomes are extremely tiny. They are over 10,000 times smaller than the thickness of a strand of hair. So to search for them among the billions of other particles in a saliva sample requires an extremely sensitive technique which is a key technological challenge. To this end, in my PhD, I work on a technique called Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy, or SIRS. Now, SIRS utilizes the unique interaction of lasers with metal nanostructures to help detect tiny particles. The lasers interact with the chemical bonds in these particles to give very specific signals called Raman signals. But these signals happen to be weak, so we make metal nanostructures to help enhance these signals by over a million times. This helps detect the tiniest of particles in saliva, including exosomes. Now, in my work, I collect a data set of healthy and unhealthy samples, which are used to train machine learning models for the purpose of diagnosis. In fact, our group has used this for gastric cancer diagnosis, and we already have an accuracy of over 70%. My PhD thesis focuses on addressing the challenges like higher accuracy, collection time, to help bring this closer to clinical trials. And my dream is to see this technology enable early, non-invasive, and more accessible diagnosis of cancer to save lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agar. Thank you. Um, I work in cancer research too, so it's interesting to see how many people are also working. Uh, it's a competition. Um, all right, so first question. Why did you decide to submit in the grad grant? Um, 
I've been afraid of the crowd in general, so I don't want to be afraid anymore. So this felt like a very nice opportunity <laughs> to get over that. Yeah. No, that's, I'm happy that you're here. <laughs> um, it was great um, as an audience member, so thank you. Thank you. Um, is anyone watching from home or from here? Yeah, my, my family uh, from New oh, Delhi, they w woke up six Aww. in the morning and my, <laughs> and my my partner is also watching from New York. Oh, oh partners and families, all y'all are doing great, thank you. Um, fun fact about yourself. So, um, so I'm a true material scientist to an extent that I'm 0.2% titanium. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, as GSA's president, I often have to like tell people like we're nerds, but it's okay. <laughs> we know it. We're like we'll love it. Uh, but yeah, we're learning. <laughs> and what do you do outside of research? Um, probably even more than research, I like playing tennis. <laughs> okay. So every day I think about tennis, and that's one of the reasons I try to recover from all these injuries I keep getting. So and that's a big motivation every time, and I'm yeah. deeply passionate about it. Do you play on campus? Yes, on campus. Sunset? Sun, uh, more than that, the LA Tennis Center. Ooh, okay. It's, it's, it's free. It is free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for all um, UCLA people, we have like Sunset Recreation Center, we have four um, tennis fields. They're free also. You can book them. We're pretty good, and if you're looking for balls, there are a lot of balls outside. Yeah, yeah. I know. Just saying, we're not in the, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Dakota Tyler from Astronomy and Astrophysics, who will be characterizing stellar effects on the evolution of exoplanets. Leave Los Angeles and look up in the night sky, you will see stars. They do exist, I promise. Now, a lot of these stars are just like the sun. And just like the sun, they have planets that orbit them. We call these exoplanets. They're just planets that orbit other stars. And we haven't always known about exoplanets. We found the first ones in 1992. And, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. We found the first ones in 1992, and since then, we have found thousands of them. In fact, we found so many that we have an idea of the distribution of planets in our galaxy. And we see really interesting classes of planets, and some of them are called hot Jupiters, you can see here. Now, a hot Jupiter is very similar to Jupiter in our own solar system, which is a gas giant. It's a very massive planet that is all atmosphere. It has no surface to stand on. But unlike Jupiter in our solar system, which is far away from the sun and takes 12 years to complete one orbit, these hot Jupiters whip around their star in just three to four days. That's how close they are. Now, these are extreme planets, and, and they're pretty rare. We don't find a lot of them. Most of the planets that we find are smaller and further away, and those are really the interesting planets, the ones that perhaps could be habitable, maybe an Earth 2.0 or something like that. Now, as we investigate this distribution of planets, one thing that we have to be able to constrain is evolution. See, everything in our universe evolved. The life of a planet is no more static than yours or mine. And one way that we know that these planets evolve is called mass loss. And that's what I researched in my PhD planetary mass loss, where literally over time, planets become less massive. They lose their atmospheres to outer space. And in physics, when you want to study a theory or a model, what you do is you test it at its limits. You test it at the extremes, and that's where the hot Jupiters come in. You have an extremely massive planet with a lot of atmosphere, extremely close to a star that's blasting it with extreme radiation. And what we see when we study these planets is that in a process called photo evaporation, high energy photons from the star smack the molecules in the gas giant atmosphere, excite them, energize them, cause them to puff up and literally evaporate, escape to space. In some cases, the stellar output is so strong that it literally shapes the escaped atmosphere into a comet-like tail of material that trails the planet. Now, this is really interesting. 
a Jupiter-sized planet. It orbits in three, three days and has a comet tail of material. But overall, of course, what we want to understand is how the stars interact with the planets so that we can get a better idea of how they shape the distribution of planets in our galaxy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you know the first question. Why did you study Jupiter's grad, grad, grad slam? Grad slam? Uh, an audience of people forced to listen to me talk about space. <laughs> Easy choice. Yeah, I love that. Um, what is a fun fact about yourself? Uh, so a fun fact, I, I played football before I got into astronomy. Um, I played at the University of Kentucky several a while ago. Um, what made you, like, what did you do in your undergrad and, like, from football to astronomy? How did the transition happen then? So I had an injury. I had a knee injury. I couldn't play anymore. Uh, graduated and then didn't have any type of skills that I needed for this field, so I had to go back to community college. And then, like, seven years later, I'm right here talking to you. <laughs> That's pretty cool, yeah. And what do you do outside research? Like outside of football? research? No, I, I okay. don't play football anymore. Oh. I'm, a, um, I'm like an explorer. I just like to explore new things. So LA is cool for that. There's a lot of, um, oh, there's festivals. There's art stuff going on. I like to hike, that sort of thing. All right. Hiking, what is your favorite trail then? I don't have a favorite trail. You just, I just try to go to a new one every, every weekend or every other weekend. Like, how can you have a favorite trail? <laughs> they're the same. No, like most, this they're is not they're true. They're the same. <laughs> they're the same, right? Most of them don't have shade, so all they're just gone. And then you have mm -hmm. ones that you have an ocean view, and yeah. you have ones that are not many, very crowded. So that's always a bonus. Yeah, yeah. Okay. See? But I don't have a favorite. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, give it up for Katura. It's my pleasure to introduce you now to Brandon Tsai from Human Genetics, who will be talking about next generation COVID-19 vaccines. A 50-year-old man presents to the emergency room with shortness of breath, cough, fever, and fatigue for the past three days. Upon admission to the ER, he tests positive for COVID. But that's impossible, he says. He's gotten all the vaccines and boosters. So how did this patient still get COVID? To answer this question, let's look at how our current COVID vaccines work. The vaccines expose your body to the spike protein, which is a structure on the outside of the virus, shown in green. This trains your immune system to recognize the virus by generating antibodies against the, against the spike protein. However, each new COVID variant often has mutations in the spike protein that changes its shape, shown in yellow and orange. Now the virus looks a little different, allowing it to escape the immune system and rendering the vaccine less effective. My goal is to develop a better vaccine by targeting parts of the virus that do not mutate as frequently. As a genetic student, the first place that I looked at is the DNA sequences of one million COVID samples from around the world including data from every variant. Next, I looked at where the mutations were occurring, shown in red, and I discovered that there were some proteins that had significantly more mutations than others. The spike protein had a lot of mutations and the polymerase did not. The polymerase is a protein that's responsible for the manufacturing of viral particles and therefore vitally important for the survival of the virus. So from a survival standpoint, the spike protein is less important, so the virus can tolerate many more mutations in the spike protein, whereas the polymerase is very important, and therefore any mutations to the polymerase will likely cause the virus to die. To further support this discovery, I looked at other major coronaviruses responsible for SARS, MERS, and the common cold, and found the same exact thing in every single one of them, suggesting that the polymerase is highly unlikely to mutate even after years and years of evolution. So why does any of this matter? Over six million people have died to COVID. My discovery may be the key to a better 
longer lasting, universal, one size fits all vaccine that can literally save millions of lives. By vaccinating against proteins that rarely mutate, we can address one of the biggest problems we are facing with COVID right now, which is different variants bypassing our vaccine. I'm talking about one vaccine for every variant, past, present, and most importantly, future. My discovery is so promising that academic, biotech, and pharmaceutical labs around the world have already begun research and development for this next generation of COVID vaccines. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. We all enjoyed it. First question, why did you decide to participate in grad lab? So I actually also competed last year in the finals. Um, it was a really great experience. I had a lot of fun, you know. I love educational outreach. I love science, I love research. So combining all of those and popularizing, you know, what I find is cool and hopefully can convey to other people what I, I find interesting, so. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Of course. Uh, what is a fun fact? Fun fact about me is that I'm a dancer. Um, I was an undergrad at UCLA, and I used to compete and dance at UCLA on an undergraduate team. So if anybody here has like left late at night and have seen people dancing in the parking lot, that used to be me once upon a time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I still dance. Uh, during COVID, I had the opportunity to teach um, the UCLA uh, Special Olympics team. Um, I currently lead the medical schools dance team, which is open to everyone in the medical school. Um, yeah, so dancing is a lot of fun and I really, really enjoy it. What kind of dance do you do? I mostly do hip hop, um, but I'm pretty versatile and I could do a lot of different styles, I must say. Ooh, okay, and you mentioned medical school, so mm -hmm. um, you're an MD-PhD? Yeah, so I'm an MD-PhD student, which means eight years of schooling, four years of medical school, and four years of graduate school. I mentioned I was an undergrad at UCLA. So I've been at UCLA for 10 years already as a student. And then by the time I graduate, I'll have been here for 14 years. So if you're a little crazy and you know want to do <laughs> eight years of school, you can do what I did. <laughs> All right. And uh, what do you do for fun outside of UCLA? <laughs> like a lot of my, my colleagues, I like to hike. I like to play tennis. I like to dance. Um, something unique that hasn't been mentioned though is I'll occasionally play dodgeball and I know it's you know dodgeball like children's PE like middle school like PE class right <laughs> but <laughs> when, when you're playing dodgeball against full-grown adults and they're throwing that ball at you you really don't want to get hit <laughs> do you play in the I am league or um, there's a league out in West Hollywood and I go to their open gyms pretty frequently all right if Y'all don't know, we have an IM League for many different sports. Um, Ella and I were in a basketball IM League. <laughs> yeah, we did good. We did good. Uh, we're proud of ourselves. <laughs> we're, okay, we're playing against undergrads, okay. We have a lot of work to do outside uh, basketball, I speak to my defense. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Give it up. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> should cap this off with the dodgeball tournaments. <laughs> uh, and now we will hear from Mapi Mukhopadhyay uh, from Conservation of Material Culture, who will be speaking about protecting the Kerala, Kerala murals using material science to interpret Kerala's past. Eight years ago, one morning, in the beautiful state of Kerala in the south of India, the head priest of a centuries-old Hindu temple saw an artist taking pictures of the walls. Curious, he went closer and saw something for the first time in his life, the faint outlines of old paintings. Years later, when I was digitally processing them to show off their full splendor, um, he said to me, I can't believe we almost plastered over these walls. That's our ancestors' legacy that would have been lost forever. Now, these paintings had been neglected for decades because 
of all the fading and damage. And this is a common problem that many murals in Kerala face. And who knows what they can tell us if we only try to see them and understand them, right? Now, the paintings that have been studied, a few of them, have shown us how these, the art style has evolved or uh, developed over the centuries as Kerala's links with the rest of the world get changing, uh, along with people's perspectives. So if only a few paintings can tell us so much about Kerala's past, what wealth of information do all the unstudied historical murals contain? Uh, but then how do you study something that is barely visible? How do you keep them, how do you keep them from being plastered over when no, no one can even see them right now? So to find out, I went to Thai temples and used two types of cameras. First, I used infrared imaging to collect big picture information about the paintings. And this also helped me show these temple priests paintings that were not normally visible. So when they looked through my cameras, um, what used to only look like this suddenly looked like this. And this helped me find areas of interest for hyperspectral imaging, which can answer questions like, what kind of green is this? Based on my data, this green is most likely a mixture of indigo, like the Dainya blue jewel, and yellow ochre, which is an earth-based yellow. And this contradicts the popular belief that it should be a combination of indigo and gamboge, a plant-based yellow. Um, this greatly impacts our understanding of the trade history of Kerala, or how these materials were sourced in the past. Um, additionally, I can tell how to better conserve or protect these paintings for future generations by knowing the materials of them so that they can be conserved for future generations and continue to inspire artists and provide another anchor of identity for local communities. Thank you. Thank you, Malti. Um, again, very interesting. It's nice to see um, a lot of different kinds of research that we're all doing in different departments. Um, so why grassland? So one of the reasons I actually started my research was to make sure that more people know about the Kerala murals, because you know, a lot of people know a lot about other types of Indian art, but this is uh, not known so much. So I thought this would be the perfect platform to not only like practice communicating my research to uh, people with with without the background that you know the art history and all of those backgrounds like to more people in general and um, uh, yeah I think I think it was a good try <laughs> and why like what made you interested in like Kerala and like doing research in that space uh, so I have a I have an interesting background. <laughs> I studied engineering for six years. Okay. Uh, and then I was not really um, feeling the projects <laughs> of the <laughs> uh, that, that are you know prevalent in engineering. And so I wanted to do something more fun and engage my artistic side because before going into engineering, I wanted to become something more art, <laughs> art related. Um, and so I found this field of conservation and I was like, I will do this. This is my life now. And, uh, and so like, uh, I was looking into a lot of art, and Kerala is the state that is the neighboring state to where I grew up. And I, I wonder like why I never really saw these before. And I was like, oh, more people should see it. And so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I decided I love to that. share it. Uh, what do you do outside of research for fun? I like many of my <laughs> uh, this grad slam cohort also like to to just dance and sing and paint. Um, what yeah, kind of dancing? Uh, uh, mostly K-pop. <laughs> I just started oh, dancing. Okay. Nice. I just started dancing last year. Before that, I wasn't super confident about dancing. But then last year, I was like, I'm just gonna do something. And so K-pop was my answer. <laughs> well, thank you so so much. Give it up for Malti.
our final presenter this evening is Yifan Wu from Bioengineering, who will be uh, discussing with us understanding cells language to cure disease. Our skin cells and heart cells all have the same genome, but how can they turn out so different? The answer can be found in something called epigenetics. So what is epigenetics and why it is so important? We know DNA encodes genetic information. During development, DNA also accumulates chemical tags that determine how much or little of genes are expressed. We call this collection of chemical tags epigenome. You can imagine epigenome as cell's library. Every cell have their own library, and this library has so many books. And these chemical tags are just like the characters in their books. So every cell pick only one book to read. For example, a heart cell is reading how to become a good heart cell. <laughs> and, a skin, and a skin cell is reading 1,000 things you should know about a successful skin cell. <laughs> so if we can edit the book they are currently reading, we can tell them what we want and let them become our desired cell type. That means we can produce functional cells from the healthy cells in a patient to replace their disease or damaged ones. And this strategy is promising to cure cancer, type 1 diabetes, etc. Now you may think, this is super promising. Why nobody use it now? Well, the idea is great because cell has a different language system. They cannot understand our language, and we cannot directly read their book. Let's say if we want a skin cell to become a nerve cell, only two to three cells among 100 cells can accomplish this mission, just like these one purple cells in a bunch of green cells. And these, the difficulty of this type of conversion happens almost every time when we want to produce functional cells from the healthy cells in the patient. That means if we want to use the purple cell to treat disease, we will start with a bunch of green cells, leading to expensive cost. So my research aims to understand cells' language. Remember I said these chemical tags are just like the characters in their book. So the first thing I do is to use the high throughput sequencing tool to examine how these characters are organized into sentences and paragraphs in their book. Then, with the help of machine learning algorithm, I can discover the easy to edit locations in their book. Because if you insert the message in the wrong place, cells still don't understand and may may cause other problems. By understanding their language and having a map of the locations we should use to edit their book, I can engineer cell identity precisely to let them become whatever cell type we need. And this will also help us to produce much more purple cells using the same number of green cells. I believe this platform is of great, great potential to help the development of cell therapies and treat disease and cure disease. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I hope my skin cells can learn some things. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we all need it. Yes. Um, so why Grassman? Um, so the reason is because I'm not so confident talking, like speaking in my second language. So I just want to use this opportunity to make me feel more confident and more comfortable to talking to people and also telling people what I, we're, I'm, I'm doing here. You did great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the fun fact about yourself? So the fun fact is not only be about me. It's like every time I travel with my best friends, it will rain. And I and you think maybe this is acceptable, but like when we went to the Joshua Tree Park, we want to see the sky and see the stars. It rains very heavy and we will have the flooding alarm. <laughs> and then when we went to the Dust Valley Park, it's still a very dry area. It has heavy rain again. <laughs> so I couldn't see the stars anywhere. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you're an asset together. Yeah. <laughs> we should put it on like it's a, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so you travel a lot? Yeah. For hiking, camping? Yeah, for hiking and camping. Okay. Yeah, I really, just like my colleagues and friends, I really like hiking and camping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this is what you mostly do outside your group for fun? Yeah, and also like I enjoy cooking. 
Mm. Yeah, because I can cook like a lot of like Chinese food because I'm from China. All yeah. right. <laughs> what is your Okay, two different questions. What is your favorite food and what food do you cook? Um it's very hard to tell like which one is my favorite food because I like to eat all kinds of food. So I can cook them really well because I like to eat them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you cook the food that you like the best. The best. Um, let me think. I don't know how to like translate them, but it's like the water boiling fish is kind of like a chili food, but it's like it can give you a really delicious and crispy texture of the fish. Is it like, it, is it, does it have a soup base? Uh, it has a soup base, but it's like a chili soup base. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. Thank you so much, Yifan. Thank you. <laughs> One thing, so apparently our campus, I was noted that apparently our campus is not the smallest campus. I was told during orientation, it's not my fault, it's the second smallest after UCSF, but UCSF is only a grad school, so. Um, I still stand by what I said, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> please, please support you, Noor. <laughs> uh, please, please join me in, in giving uh, all of our presenters this evening a round of applause and <laughs> congratulate them on a job well done. <laughs> and, and thank you, Noor, for helping us get to know our presenters a little bit better this evening. And now it's time for audience choice voting. <laughs> Woohoo! I may I ask that you please turn your attention to this screen and take out your phones if you want to vote uh, for your favorite presentation tonight. You can scan that QR code and follow the directions on the screen and vote. Uh, you'll only be able to vote once though, and for those of us watching uh, at home, uh, you can also vote too, so get in on the action. You can only vote once, so vote carefully. And once you've placed your vote, uh, please feel free to stretch your legs, get up, chat, take a break. Just a reminder, uh, we will have a full reception with great food in the lobby outside the auditorium immediately following the awards presentation. Uh, we're now going to take a break, a uh, 10 minute break while our team tabulates the judges scorecards and you place your audience choice votes. Thank you. Some of you might have already discovered we're having slight technical difficulties with the poll, but we are going to work those out because we're UCLA. We're full of brilliant people.
the poll is open now. Please try again if you're having problems voting. Thank you.
two minutes left of audience choice voting. If you have not yet secured your vote, please do so now. Two minutes left until the poll closes. Thank you. Marissa Lopez, please return to the podium. Marissa Lopez, please return to the podium. Just uh, making sure all the snacks were not poison for me and Lena. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> mm. All right. Well, it seems the votes are in. I my notes say welcome back everyone, but I guess welcome back me. And uh, <coughs> we will uh, start by acknowledging and celebrating our graduate student contestants tonight by presenting each with a Grad Slam 2023 finalist certificate. And I invite the Division of Graduate Education Chief of Staff and Chief Financial Officer, Kristen McKinney, to the podium to announce the names. Uh, Nora, can you please uh, join me on stage to present the certificate? Finalists, when Kristen calls your name, could you please join Nora and I on stage to uh, get your certificate, stop for a photo, and then return to your seat. Good evening, everybody. I get to do the best part. I love this part of my job. So, <laughs> all right. Let me move this up a little bit. I'm gonna keep it a little shorter than I did last time. Um, so, congratulations to all of our finalists. I now have the pleasure of announcing the audience choice third, second, and first place winners. Okay. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Certificates. Okay, in order of presentation, Jenna Wabe. <laughs> Elaine Jessica Castillo Camargo. Judah Van Zant. <laughs> 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 
Ella Petter. Alexander Quaco. Siddhartha Srivastav. Dakota Tyler. Brandon Sai. Mapi Mukapatia. Ifun Wu. Now do I get to give away the money? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so um, I will start with the Audience Choice Award, which is a, a $1,000 fellowship. Our Audience Choice winner tonight is Brandon Sai from Human Genetics. <laughs> Come get your big check. In third place with a $2,000 fellowship, Ella Petter from Computer <laughs> Science. Our second place winner with a $3,000 scholarship is Siddhartha Srivastra. Yeah. And in first place, our 2023 UCLA Grad Slam champion, who will be, be winning a $5,000 fellowship and representing UCLA at the UC-wide Grad Slam competition in San Francisco in May. Please welcome Brandon Sai from Human <laughs> Genetics. Now you have two big checks. Congratulations to all our winners and finalists. Please give these outstanding scholars one more big round of applause for all of their work. How exciting, exciting, exciting. So on that exciting note, we are concluding our formal program for the evening. Awardees, please stick around while we take pictures with each of you here on stage with your trophies. Yes, more pictures. Uh, and judges, please stay uh, for some group photos as well. And everyone else, please make your way outside to the lobby for a celebratory reception in honor of the finalists and their outstanding research with, with delicious snacks that are not poison. Uh, the <laughs> finalists, judges, and hosts will take photos uh, at the step and repeat outside once they finish uh, with pictures in the auditorium. And that, that screen is called a step and repeat. We all learned something new today. Uh, everyone else is welcome to take photos at the step and repeat before and after this. Thank you so much again for joining us this evening. And one more round of applause for our contestants. Yeah.